Namaste, viewers. Welcome to Jaipur Dialogue USA. And today we are going to focus on who is India's friend? You know, the world is split today because of geopolitical factors. And, and the geopolitical factors play a tremendous role in its own way. You know, the world is split today because of geopolitical factors. Press the bell icon on YouTube and don't miss another update. <clears throat> uh, sorry for the confusion because of the system part of it. So I have fixed it. So let's start. Um, welcome to the show, viewers. And we, as, as we mentioned, uh, that today we are going to talk about the geopolitical factors that play a critical role in international relationships. And the geopolitical factors dominate varieties of issues, which are social, economic, political, and technology driven at the same time. So India has a, a remarkable distinction of being in a, what, what I call part-time lover syndrome with many countries. We are United States, strategic partner, natural partners, and allies of all kinds. And so is with Soviet Russia, USSR, which was once upon a time, a big supporter of India and has always been. With China, Chinese are famous for following a very pragmatic political stand. Whereas we Indians have been part of the non-aligned movement, and remarkably sent emotional about our, how the West or the rest of the world treats us. To discuss this entire issue, I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Adit Adityanji, who has established an institution called Council for Strategic Affairs. He lives here in the United States and his background is remarkable. He is a physician from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, a psychiatrist, and as such, he has a very different vision his inspiration to set India's image right has resulted in establishing Council of Strategic Affairs as a think tank. And as you may have noticed, his Twitter handle is Dr. Think Tank. So, Doctor, without much ado, uh, let's get on with this aspect of the fact that, you know, yesterday we noticed uh, that Nike declared officially that we are a Chinese brand. So think about it from this point of view that straight away, China has acquired Nike without paying a penny. Think about it from that point of view. So the globe is remarkably, you know, challenging scenario right now. Everybody is trying to extract its own pound of flesh. Where does India figure out in terms of its relationship, friendship? As the saying goes, there are no permanent friends and there are no permanent allies in international relations but your own interests that drive relationships and equations. Go ahead, make my day. Well, good morning, Mr. Jha. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me again. And we had uh, some discussion in the last session we had yes. talking about Indo-US relationship. And we did discuss about this famous saying, uh, saying from Lord Palmerston, that there are no permanent enemies or permanent friends, they are permanent interests. And I went on to Hitopadesha saying uh, in Sanskrit, I'm not going to repeat it this time. <laughs> but I'm going to actually cite a campaign slogan that was used in United States in 1992. Very successfully, uh, and that campaign slogan was, it is the economy stupid. And I think we need to realize that everywhere, it is the economy which drives the relationships, whether it is in personal life or whether it is in geostrategic issues. Nations have interests, but those interests are governed by economic commercial, 
and mercantile interests. There are geostrategic reasons, but gone are the days when you used to have hot wars. We haven't had hot wars, major wars, since World War II. There have been some skirmishes here and there between countries, but essentially it is the economic issues, it's the trade issues that are governing the international relationships at this point in time. And somehow, since its accession to WTO in 2000, China has exploited the free and fair trade mechanism in the world after promising to make some benchmark changes and has become basically manufacturer of the world. And in that process, China has accumulated $3.4 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. You know, the next country is Japan. Japan's foreign exchange reserves are 1.4 trillion. The third is Switzerland, which has around $850 billion of foreign exchange reserves. And of course, India crossed the Rubicon and from seventh or eighth, this is now the fourth largest foreign exchange reserve holder with $604 billion. Now with that $3.4 trillion, China is in position to buy any country, any government, and they do. So you're talking about just Nike, which is a company. See what happened in Sri Lanka, you know, Chinese decided to, you know, develop the Hambantota port, which was expected not to have any, you know, port calls, commercial port calls. But once it was built, Sri Lankan government owed a lot of money and they couldn't pay. So now the port is under a 99 years lease with China. And Chinese have issued a special part passport. It's called Columbus Port Passport and it is in Chinese language. So what is happening that with the economy in ascendance, China is able to purchase Small time countries, island countries, they've done it pretty much everywhere. They've greased the palms. Not every developing country has a sound system. China utilizes the stance of not interfering in the internal affairs. They don't put benchmark on democracy, on human rights and things like that. Essentially, the way to influence decision making is Whoever is in power, that person needs to be, you know, oiled a little bit and they will be on your side. They did same thing in Maldives till there was a change in government. So bottom line is that whoever controls the economy will be the top geostrategic power in the world. And China is at this point in time aspiring to be the number one, aspiring to be the number one in a bipolar world. And their aspiration for being number one is not something that they figured out overnight. You know, in geopolitics, as the saying goes, you move the needle or you push the envelope based on your strategic intent your strategic desire. And that's what is important to notice. To me, for as many years that I have watched uh, India-related affairs and I have been in the forefront because of my banking and the other relationships that I have had in the global field, what I notice is that India doesn't have a strategy. The strategy of non-aligned movement rendered us important. I use a strong word for that. 
because you as you rightly observed that your entire strength political clout economic comes from economy if you are a strong economy you begin to command a clout that's the story of the united states because it's the number one economy in the world china realized that and my guess my estimate is my analysis is that after the famous collapse of ussr after the famous collapse of ussr engineered by the united states united states ussr became was bankrupt at that time it could not withstand the economic might of us as a result of which led to its disintegration and when you have that scenario when we when you have that scenario then china figured it out that us is going to come after me and look what they did when russian economy collapsed the country collapsed nobody missed russia to quote the quote and quote miss nobody felt the absence of ussr because not a single country in the world was consuming anything made in russia other than oil as a resource part of it but when china figured it out they went into buying into united states its strategy to bring american businesses to you know to china offer them a very cheap manufacturing agenda and increase profitability thereby and the chinese figured it out that for american corporations all that matters is that beautiful word called profit and so the margins became bigger and american companies ran in hordes to china thus china became the manufacturing hub of the world that's where the 3 trillion reserves comes from talking about that from the indian perspective and we will focus on who is india's friend so i would preface it by saying everybody is a friend and everybody is an enemy is the question is that how do you align your global positioning and your personal needs of the country to determine who is your friend or who is not your friend and uh, so to that at end china has everything made in china is in every american household not only american household but every country in the world so whether it's a garden chair or a pin for coronavirus or 911 post uh, attack the pins and flags were also made in china so all the masks and ppes are coming from china the so china has been very smart about garnering economic strength how about india how has india missed out to understand that simple logic so you are right when you say that it did not happen overnight chinese had a strategy and i think we need to go back to history 200 years ago uh, 200 years ago uh, pretty much 33% of the world gdp was controlled by china and between 25 to 28% of the world gdp was controlled by india actually those were the two dominant economic powers and of course there's a cyclicity in international era and uh, you know there was a ascendancy of the west unlike china which learned the lessons of humiliation by the colonial powers in india we tend to forgive and forget and if you see post 1947 india in order to project what india could do in future we really need to have a real critical in depth objective academic post mortem of where we failed where were our acts of commission or omission under different governments very objectively unless we do that without passion without emotions i know everyone has their biases unlike china we are a democratic country we don't buy the you know dictates of the paramount leader whether that paramount leader was mao or deng or at this point in time xi jinping in india the system is different so you have to work in a different system 
in China, there has been continuity of the governance. So they have been able to plan long term basis. <coughs> in India, the planning is very short term. And I think if you really look critically, pretty much at every level, we have made strategic errors. We don't plan long term. Most of the planning is short term. It is till the next election. And that creates a problem that we haven't had a vision. Traditionally, we take pride in saying we are a peace loving country. We are a peace loving nation. In international geopolitics, India was perceived, quote unquote, as a pacifist nation. So we have done our share of mistakes. Today is not the time to review all those mistakes. But unless the policy, diplomacy, and strategic community in India does a cold-blooded post-mortem of previous failures, we will not be able to deal with the challenges of today and plan for India's future. You know, history is very important. And I may remind you the famous saying by George Santayana, those who fail to learn from the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. And I may also like to sort of, you know, go back to Shakespeare. There's a famous saying, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are the underlings. <laughs> this was said by Cassius to Brutus when Cassius was trying to prevent Julius Caesar from becoming the monarch. So rather than externalizing the blame that this happened, that happened, that was the international situation, India has to look within and we have to do some reforms. We have to do structural reforms at every level of our system. I'm not saying that democracy does not work, but there's need for reform in the democratic system so we can deal with these challenges of today and plan for the future. Well, you, said, you said something very, very close to my heart that uh reflect within and we have to analyze from our mistakes and one of the things which i do know that in international politics or personal relationship everywhere there is a thing called you don't forget forgive and forget both at the same time that's the biggest blunder we commit indians commit because you either forget or either forgive don't let both happen at the same time because if you do that History is bound to repeat itself. Yes. And that's the problem with our structure is that we are not learning anything. We are a storehouse of knowledge. We talk about our historical past, that we were 26% of the global economy without English, that too. And you know, so the important part is who does that study? I mean, I'm 100% sure that the wise people of the external affairs and the wise people of bureaucracy who are enshrined the responsibility to do these kind of work, they don't. And if they do, I don't know what they are because they are never shared. What we know by just observing, there is a position paper in America from think tanks and study groups which lays down what America should do or ought to do. The Chinese are remarkably pragmatic. They have said so. Post Galwan, China said that we follow a pragmatic policy. United States and EU, they have their own agenda and they push and they push their agenda. What is India's agenda? And that's a very important point you raised that we have to begin to reflect. You know, I don't like to quote too many things. Uh, you know, I don't like to quote. I don't like to go back into history because history past is something we can't change. The only thing we can do with history is learn from it. And if we haven't learned from it, then you can't blame others for whatever happens to us. So, you know, we are not pushing any agenda. 
So do you think that India is learning? The think tanks of India, the wise people, the wisdom that lives in our minds and homes and texts and literature, Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita, we have learned from there that appeasement and pandering never works, but we still are doing it. It fulfills Einstein's slogan. Stupidity's definition is that keep doing the same thing, hoping for a different outcome. It doesn't happen. So if the world is pragmatic, realistic, pushing their agenda, we are not doing anything in that sense. We are always into what you said earlier on, firefighting mode. You know, I mean, look at it this way. I, I totally am stunned that, you know, a country as small as Israel is able to handle all its big neighbors. And they are friends with Saudi Arabia in the new changed dynamics of the world, right? They're collaborating with GC, GCC countries. Whereas we, such a mighty big nation of 1.3 billion people, are not able to have a cordial relationship with our neighbors. You know, and, and, a, and, a, and, and a, broke, a broke country like Pakistan still drives our reaction to what they do. There is no concerted response until Mr. Modi came along. Then there was a re response, not reaction. So when have we missed out on opportunity other than the glorious one, which Mr. Nehru let go the Security Council seat to China? So let's begin to analyze where we have made a mistake, what we could have done differently. Well, if you want me to, it might take some time. What I will do for you, analysis of prime minister by prime minister where we made the mistakes. Sure. And I wanted to say to you here and to the audience at large that we are going to have this conversation on an ongoing basis with Dr. Adityanji, including, uh, including what I call uh, with the with other thinkers as well, and uh, you know proceed that in that fashion. Uh, go so ahead. Post 1947, uh, you know you mentioned about non-alignment and Nehruvian blunders. Actually, non-alignment was only a very small part of blunders that were Himalayan in nature committed by our second prime minister, I would say, because I still believe that first prime minister of independent India was Subhash Bose. Nehru was the second one. Uh, Nehru was not elected democratically in a democratic country. You know, he was anointed to the prime ministership by somebody by name M.K. Gandhi. And there was a cult following that eulogized, saying, Ahimsa Paramo Dharma, we were peace loving, we were messengers of peace, we were Shanti Dutz. It went to the extent that Nehru in the initial years of independence questioned the need for India having armed forces. It was said that India only needs a police force to maintain law and order because we don't have any, any enemies and we don't bear any grudge towards anyone. So the armed forces were very much neglected. The model of development, economic development India adopted under Nehru was Fabian socialism. Nehru was very smitten by the Communist Party in China being a Fabian socialist. And I think there was a delusional belief in Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai syndrome. Nehru also had some personal ambitions. And I think one of them was the quest for Nobel Peace Prize. So besides non-alignment, the major mistakes that happened was gifting Tibet to China on a platter, gifting a Xi chain to China by saying that not a blade of grass grows there, not making you know corrective responses when China was building Karakoram Highway, taking Jammu and Kashmir issue to United Nations while our army was winning the war against Pakistani invaders. Of course, you said declining the United Nations permanent seat in Security Council. 
refusing the offer of Nepal's king to offer merger of Nepal with India, refusing to take the offer of taking the Gwadar port, which was offered to India by Oman, gifting Coco Island to Burma, as it was called at that time, refusal to use India's air force during 1962 India-China war. It could have, at that time, comparatively, Indian air force was several times superior to Chinese air force. And it could have made the difference. So that those were the blunders committed by the first prime minister. Now let's move on to Mrs. Gandhi's tenure. There were a number of strategic achievements, if you do pros and cons. So during Indira Gandhi's time, we had liberation of Bangladesh in 1971. That was a strategic achievement. Facing the US pressure, especially Nixon administration boldly in 1971 was a strategic achievement. Conducting the smiling Buddha nuclear ex explosion in 1974 was a strategic achievement by Indira Gandhi. Merger of state of Sikkim with India in 1975 was a strategic achievement. Sending Indian expeditions to Antarctica and establishing a permanent station in Antarctica, Dakshin Gangotri, was a strategic achievement during Indira Gandhi's time. And as you know, in India, the buck stops at prime minister. But let's review the serial strategic blunders during Indira Gandhi's time. Not solving Jammu and Kashmir issue while Indian Army won and captured 94,000 Pakistani POWs. It was a major blunder. If I would try to say in different words, India snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. There are other issues during the Shimla agreement. There was too much of trust on verbal assurances given by Julfikar Bhutto, which he went, you know, reneged the moment he left India after getting the right type of Simla accord. Indira Gandhi also did some other strategic mistakes. One of them was declining the offer to join the ASEAN as a founding member. India at that time said, we don't believe in blocks, you know, strategic blocks or war blocks. No doubt we deliberated Bangladesh and recognized it, but we should have sorted out the very contentious, the enclave issue at that time. We were in a position since we liberated the country we should have had some permanent assets in that country in terms of our military. We would have, you know, saved us a lot of grief. Now, although I credit Indira Gandhi for doing the nuclear explosion in 1974, but Indira Gandhi could have done the explosion, the nuclear test in 1967 rather than wait till 1974. What difference it would have made? India would have been the part of the P5 that declared the accepted nuclear weapon states because the force of entry of NPT was in 1967. And I think from time of Nehru, India did have the technical capability of doing a nuclear explosion. In fact, the West was looking for India when India will do the explosion. Subsequently, even after doing that explosion, we failed to weaponize the, you know, experience and expertise obtained in Smiling Buddha test. Indira Gandhi also did mistakes strategically by gifting Kachatibu Islands to Sri Lanka without permission from Indian Parliament. That was a strategic blunder. So. In each prime minister's time, we have made strategic mistakes. Now let's go to Muraji Desai era and what were the strategic mistakes done. 
The major mistake Muradji Desai did was refusing permission to give to Israeli warplanes to use Jam Nagar Airways for refueling to enable Israeli jets to bomb Pakistan's Kahuta nuclear facility. When the proposal was discussed, Muradji Desai said, it is sheer madness. And subsequently, Pakistan gave its highest civilian order to an Indian prime minister, Nishan A. Pakistan, that was given to Muradji Desai. Even Muradji Desai government could have done Pokhran too, they did not. For Muradji Desai as prime minister, personal morality was the yardstick for geopolitics, which was very strange. In fact, Muradji Desai was on record to say that he liked Jimmy Carter, the then US president, because Jimmy Carter was not a womanizer. And when Jimmy Carter visited India for a presidential visit, uh, he gave very hard time to Muraji Desai on not signing NPT and not resuming the fuel supply uh, enriched uranium for Karapur atomic power reactor you know, plant. So again, we did mistakes. We got you know, influenced by emotions. We did not do cold-blooded, hard-nosed analysis. And lastly, I will say, that during Muraji Desai's time, we had a very, very likable politician who was the Minister for External Affairs, who made a state visit to China. And during that China visit, China attacked Vietnam. I think there was lack of intelligence preparation and diplomatic preparation for that visit. So again, we are seeing that, you know, we go by platitudes mm -hmm. rather than by what is the hard reality. Now let's look at Rajiv Gandhi's time. Rajiv Gandhi again did not follow 1974 nuclear test by another test. In fact, he went the other way. In 1988, he had a Delhi declaration for universal nuclear disarmament with Mikhail Gorbachev. And this was present, uh, you know, present to United Nations General Assembly. So we won some, you know, brownie point for projecting India's soft power or India's, you know, peacefulness. But it hurt us in the long run. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi made other mistakes, and despite having a massive parliamentary majority, the Bofors gun scandal became an albatross around his neck. Uh, there were other mistakes. There was too much of access to Italians and intelligence and security apparatus of India. <clears throat> other mistakes was that Rajiv Gandhi, being somewhat naive, was played like a violin by Sri Lankan President Junius Richard Jayawardena. In fact, the IPKF was sent to Sri Lanka without consultation with the army chief. There was no preparation. When India liberated Bangladesh, Manik Shah conferred with Indira Gandhi and said, I need time. And it took eight to nine months to prepare that. IPKF was sent to Sri Lanka without any you know, strategic consultations with the defense establishment. It was a blunder. We lost almost 1,200 Indian soldiers. But Rajiv Gandhi did take some strategic actions, which were bold in the neighborhood. And I'll tell you what for those. There was aerial drop of 25 tons of relief supplies to Sri Lankan tunnels. I think this was pre-runner to or forerunner to what United Nations says R2P, responsibility to protect. Indian jets, you know, dropped 25 tons of food to stranded northern Jaffna Tamil population to save them from the you know state torture kind of thing. Rajiv Gandhi also actually intervened in Maldives and that projected India's power when an attempted coup in Maldives was reversed. So not everything was black and white, there are positive things. Let's come to Narsing Rao's time. Now, Take a, just to speed up on it, that because we want to bring about certain other subject matters too. So tell okay. us quickly on that, yes. So Narsingha Rao's time, the major problem was 
getting pressure from Bill Clinton about nuclear testing prior to signing of CTBT. There was a lot of pressure on Narasimha Rao. Then we come to Inder Kumar Gujral, the infamous Gujral doctrine. Uh, you know, our intelligence assets were sort of, you know, uh, dismantled in Pakistan and uh, other neighboring countries. The RNAW uh, was asked to dismantle within short period of time of six months, the damage done, the loss of intelligence assets was phenomenal. So, I mean, I could go on, you know, successive prime ministers, what strategic achievements were there, what strategic mistakes were there. But since we don't have time, we will not go through that. We will, what, what I want to do is that this is, this is the beginning of a conversation and we will have many more conversations on this issue because this involves the entire Indian diaspora globally. Because we need to know, because 90% of the time, because of the secrecy or apathy, we do not know the truth about many things. And as a result of which, most of the time, majority of the Indians are only wondering in the state of wonderment. So I think the point that I'm trying to make mention now is that we are at a particular point in time. We are we want to talk about who are our friends, but there are no permanent friends, and alignment of interests has to happen. So the question is, where do we go from here knowing what we know? Because you know, in defense production. Defense contract. India is the third largest buyer in the world. Yes. Are we using that cap capacity? For example, India can easily be the second manufacturing hub for the world post China because there is a tremendous amount of frustration in the in the global manufacturing community for Chinese behavior. Now people know that. The third is that India has reached. You very rightly said that India reached the Rubicon because I came here in ninety one. India has one billion dollar worth of exchange results. That's it. Today we are doing six hundred six. So the point is that there has been progress, but we have not achieved our potential. And how do we reckon that today India? This is a, this is bizarre. India buys weapons from Russia, from whatever. Everybody buys weapons from whoever. But we are a country that are that is easily sermonized by everybody for everything. Whether it's human rights violation, but nobody will tell China anything. You know, belligerence on democratic rights. India is attacked, but nobody will talk about Pakistan. Things like that is is shows that we are not into the grip of the situation. So Russia has supported India throughout. Uh, otherwise, Kashmir would have gone in the UN resolution long time ago. The Security Council vote. So we owe something to Russia. Russia stood by India in 1971. The question I am asking is that how do we change the equation of being part-time lovers to a uh, to a solid associates with every country in the world? And for that, I believe the India's strategic intent has to be very clear. And this is what I am saying that you know we have done our mistakes. We should learn from those mistakes. Tackle the challenge of uh, challenges of the day and plan for future. And by future, I don't mean five years or ten years. We have to plan for fifty years or hundred years. That should be the scale on which we should be planning. Uh, I think a lot has been said about non-alignment. I think we have moved away from that. I think post 2014, there has been change in strategic thinking. We are being much more hard-nosed in using our quote unquote hard power. You know, Joseph Nike coined this word uh, soft power and hard power, but there's something called smart power. So we have started to use a little bit of smart power, not entirely, but to a certain extent. I think first India has to become its own friend. That's the most important thing. India has to be in love with India. That's the prerequisite. If you are not in love with yourself, you will not go anywhere. So you have to be a little bit, not just narcissistic, but also become self-confident and not, you know, start getting panicky when any Tom, Dick or Harry makes a comment. So living in America, you know, they say 
that there's doctrine of American exceptionalism. I would like to tell India's policymakers and strategist community that there is an analogous doctrine of Indian exceptionalism. We are not part of the West in the traditional sense. We are not part of the OIC. We are not part of NATO. We are not part of APAC, APEC. We are not part of the Security Council, you know, P5. We are out of a lot of, you know, international organizations and regimes. And yes, we have been criticized. India has been the country which has been severely sanctioned in the past from 1947 onwards, either because of Cold War, hardcore reality, or following the 1974 nuclear explosion. You know, uh, there were sanctions in each and every technical sphere. But oh, we have withstood those challenges. So there is a doctrine of Indian exceptionalism. We shall not actually be supplicant before the International Criminal Court. That sets us apart. You know, we are the only country that has not signed NPT and CTBT, but is still allowed to do nuclear trade, despite not being part of NSG, which is blocked by China. We are the only such country that has become part of NPCR, Missile Technology Control Regime the Wassenaar arrangement for control of, you know, dual, uh, dual capability exports or Australia rule for chemical, you know, warfare, things like that. So there is a doctrine of Indian exceptionalism that we need to understand. And I think when any dog barks on the street, the Indian elephant needs to continue to walk without paying much heed. I, I love that. I love that analogy for the simple reason that, uh, you know, we have become victims of sermonization yes. by everybody else. And the, all the factors that you mentioned about Indian exceptionalism, those, are ma those seem to be a matter of mistake rather than a deliberate policy. And the point which I'm trying to make here is that we are not natural partners in any of these organizations. But we are always expecting, quote unquote, that we should be part of that. So we are not part of G7, but G7 gets expanded to G10, and we would be happy to be there. We are not asserting ourselves in the manner that we need to do, as you rightly mentioned, that we have to begin to have a conscious, pragmatic, practical agenda builder for India. And I love that statement of yours, that India needs to love itself and that brings me to the factor that how are how are indians or indian political parties do they have india's interests in mind or is it their own selfish vested interest that drives every other agenda which disenables the prime minister or anybody else to have a cohesive policy outside so that's what is important i hate this idea like i said to you earlier we get sermonized on human rights violation, but the rest of the world doesn't care. Two hoots on China, and does, China doesn't care. Pakistan is still asking for evidence of 2611. They, they violate minority rights, but when we begin to bring a policy to bring about minority protection, we are told that we are victimizing the Islamic community for by being sectarian. That's the part, the narrative part is critical. We don't seem to know that. So I had alluded to that, you know, despite being a democracy, we need to do multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral reforms. And those reforms are required in pretty much every sphere of life so that we move forward in a positive way. You did mention about Indian political parties. We know there are major problems there. We had one political party that actually signed a memorandum of understanding when they were in power with Chinese Communist Party. And no one knows what was written in that memorandum of understanding. Uh, the leaders of that party have been supping with the devil during the Oklahoma crisis. 
a certain youth leader was found to be having dinners with the Chinese ambassador. A certain youth leader reportedly went for a pilgrimage to Kalash Mansarovar, but met Chinese officials there. So we have some internal problems there, uh, not only in that party, but in other parties also, uh, that some of the terror related issues, you know, terrorists absconding uh, because they were going to be or given prior warnings, uh, the economic offenders, uh, you know, fled the country because they were given prior warnings or they were threatened by the mafia uh, elements controlled by certain political parties. So we do need to reform our system. We need to reform our judicial conundrum, which has become a nightmare because it does not do anything. You know, our electoral system, you know, you have 29 states, you have nine union territories or now the, the union territories have increased. Every month there is some election going on. Do you want the election commission to run the government? So we have serious questions. Every executive decision of the government of the day is questioned by the Supreme Court or the high courts either by filing a PIL or by taking suo moto cognizance of those issues. In fact, because of successive weak governments, Indian judiciary, I'm sorry to say, has usurped the power of the executive in a very myopic manner. <laughs> uh, so we have a lot of challenges to do internal reform before we can say who is our ally, who is our friend. But I will tell you certain things, you know. There have been some nations that have been two trusted friends over a period of time. Some security and, uh, you know, alliances have changed. We were uh, not friendly, so friendly with the United States. We are now good partners. But I think more than deciding who are our friends, we have to decide who are our strategic adversaries. I won't use the word enemy. So there's no way I can ever say from a strategic point of view that Pakistan is a friend of India. Pakistan is a strategic adversary, whatever the nature of that adversary. Uh, there is no way I can say China is a friend of India. China is a strategic adversary. And if you remember, during Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government, we had a very, very, you know, dynamic defense minister. His name was George Fernandez. And he said, China was our enemy number one or strategic adversary number one. And there was a lot of furor in India and abroad. Well, that's a reality, you know. If you do cold blooded analysis, China is not a friend of India. China is an adversary. It is a strategic adversary. It's not even a peer competitor for India. So we need to ascertain for ourselves who are our adversaries, who are our strategic threats. There's a very famous saying that you keep your friends close to you, but you keep your enemies closer. Okay. Yeah. There's no problem talking with our adversaries because you want to know their mindset. But don't be seduced by that, you know, sort of fraternalization. Unfortunately, we have done that time and again that we had the Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai syndrome. And then more recently, we had the Wuhan spirit and Chennai connect. Uh, I think we had some problems there. We did not anticipate what China was capable of doing. So again, it's a question of emotions versus hardcore analysis, geopolitical analysis. So by identifying your adversaries, you will be able to plan to work with them, engage them, and subsequently contain them. So there was a term called engagement, which is a combination of engagement and containment. This term was coined by somebody by name Zalme Khalilzad, if you know. He was the special rep for AFPAC region during Bush 
junior, you know, uh, uh, Bush 43 uh, sort of presidency. So he coined that term. So yes, we'll have to engage China, but we'll have to also try to contain China. Whether it is you said it, you said it, you said it very correctly. That assessment of who our friends are, who are our adversaries, if not enemies. But what I do know, in my mind, I'm convinced that China and Pakistan mean no good to India, yes. and we have to treat that as a realistic scenario rather than being a romantic mood. Aman ki asha or chain China China bhai bhai, wo nahi hone wala hai. To use the Hindi ka phrase, Hindi sentence, wo nahi hone wala. They want you destroyed. Let's yes. put it this way very mildly. So therefore, there would be a strategic or tactical attack on India all the time. Otherwise, yes. otherwise, how do you expect? How do you exp explain China occupying vital road 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 structure in Gilgit Baltistan for its CPEC? So the yes. question is, China has been gifted. As a bargain deal, but let's come back to. As a, we are running out of time now, but I wanted to say to you, Aditinji, that uh, you and your team are most welcome to come back again because we want to dive into this in a serious way, with a perspective that history is what it is. We can't change the past, and we have to look at the future part of it. And there comes a very important mindset issue, and that is very disappointing. What I'm trying to say here is that, say, for example, Ravi Shankar Prasad ji. I'm naming it because that was a big talk in Indian media just a, two days ago or till yesterday. That Ravi Shankar Prasad ji complained about Twitter banning him for one hour, and he listed out a long tweet, series of tweet, how they have violated Indian laws. Now the question here is very simple. I said to him, I said it in my tweet, is Suspend them for at least some hours, if not days, if not for months. Read them the riot act after that. But if you are complaining, then do something about it. If you say that they have done gross violation, then let, let it be taken care of. But if you just say it is a gross violation, but do nothing, and if you accept their explanation, then it defeats the mindset of the people. And you are right. The India needs to change itself. There has to be a demand for people to take action against Twitter. It's not a life-saving drug, nor it is a life-saving product that India will not be able to handle. So we need to address our issues very carefully. But going back into the US-India relationship, I know that Russia will be handled. I know China is what it is. People are getting to the grips. The current foreign minister is a, is a veteran foreign service official. But one thing which is there, that the Indian mindset must get over the complacency and inattention to facts and details. That's very critical. And we have to make a determination between strategic arrangements and transactional deals. And we have to tell others that don't preach me not to be friends with Iran or Russia if you are teaming up with Pakistan and some other country that I don't want to. Exactly. So you are bringing an issue, and that is possibility of sanctions against India for CATSA uh, violation, uh, I, there is a threat. There is like a hanging sword of Democles over India's neck. If India goes ahead with S-400 uh, missile defense system from Russia, United States under the CATSA, which is an act passed by U.S. Congress in 2017 will impose sanctions on India. And I think we, our current position should be that, you know, too bad, you know, the deal is done. If you, fire, uh, you know, impose sanctions on India, then it will harm the bilateral strategic relationship. You need us in Quad. You need us everywhere in Indo-Pacific to do power projection. You need more us more than we need you at this point in time. Because we have shown that we can you know, build things, we can build missiles domestically. You put sanctions on us for you know, uh, solid fuel uh, engines for the uh, ballistic missiles. We do it ourselves. 
So we have done everything by ourselves despite your sanctions. And if you once again impose sanctions again, and that would be the message to the State Department, we will deal with it, but you will lose our goodwill. So you need to be circumspect. What you want to happen to the geopolitics of Asia, of entire world, would you allow a hegemon to go unchecked? If you want to check that hegemon, you need India. So we need to do those kind of calculations. We need to be able to assert ourselves strategically and say that this is what we want. I will not talk about Twitter because that's a minor fly. It just can be sorted. But dealing with our friends and adversaries, we have to realize the powers we have. And we don't need to you know, be deluded by the soft power concept or propaganda. We should stop saying that we have never attacked anyone. We don't covet anybody's land. I think we need to look back. You know, you are very fond of saying Satyamev Jayate. That's true. I am very fond of saying Shastrain Rakshate Rashtre Shastra Chinta Pravartate. A, a nation that is protected by its weaponry can have the you know, highest possible discussion on any academic field. So if India is protected, India will rise, the arts, the culture, the literature, the civilization, everything will rise. And India has to protect itself by whatever means. And India has to develop its strategic capabilities by its own. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that I always say is that, like you mentioned, that they need us more than we need them. I think we need to get out of that mindset as well, because India's relevance is not in doubt. Between Indian Ocean and the subcontinent, we control a big thing. We are a big economy. We have potential to become a $3 trillion foreign exchange results country, but we have to achieve that potential. So when we talk about the fact that people need us more than we need, it brings about some kind of a complacency in our mindset. And people don't realize, people don't realize that if we think that we are important, we have to make ourselves relevant and in the context. And that's what is important for India to do. This is we, will, we, will, we will have more conversations on this. But what is important here is where do we go from here? So with these thoughts, I want to thank you. We are a new channel. We are extension of Jaipur Dialogues in India. We have launched Jaipur Dialogue USA to reach out to the Indian diaspora globally. So like, subscribe, and share. Press the bell icon, and let's get to know each other. Thanks to the YouTube part of it, we can reach everybody everywhere. So with these words, we will come back again for an in-depth more conversation on this issue for creating the narrative for the rest of the world, the Indian narrative, that we cannot afford that, you know, we have to become relevant. There has been disappointments as well. So thank, thank you. you very much. You want to say something, the last word? It was pleasure to talk to you. And as I said last time, India is rising, India is shining, and that will continue to happen. I'm very yeah. confident about that. And we have to accelerate that pipeline. That's what is important. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Likewise, no. Press the bell icon on YouTube and